Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in today's video we will talk about diseases of the skin appendages. It is a continuation of our dermatology series and today we will talk about diseases of the hair, namely different forms of alopecia and about diseases of the pilosebaceous unit, which will include acne vulgaris, rosacea and perioral, der perioral dermatitis. So first, alopecia. Alopecia is the loss or absence of hair in areas that usually have hair, especially on the scalp. There are generally two forms. The sclerosing type, which is irreversible. In this form, the hair follicles are destroyed. The second form is a non-scarring form in which the hair follicles go in a sort of break called telogen phase. Alopecia areata is a type of non-scaring alopecia. <clears throat> Usually it occurs in an oval area and there is no visible inflammation. The etiology remains unknown, but it is thought to be due to an autoimmune process, which is mediated by T cells, so basically that patients can have a genetic predisposition. It can occur at any time in life, but generally children are more often affected. The loss of hair is gradual and can take months to become apparent. There can also be a time of spontaneous regrowth of hair. The new hair is sometimes thinner or more vulnerable to break and might be unpigmented, so it can appear white or grey. The areas of hair loss can be solitary or multiple. Alopecia totalis is the total hair loss of all scalp hair. It is a subform of alopecia areata, however here inflammation of the hair follicle occurs that leads to the loss of hair. Alopecia universalis is the total hair loss of all scalp hair and all body hair. It is also a form of alopecia areata. The next type I want to talk about is called ophiasis. It also is a form of alopecia areata and is occurring often in children. It is a hair loss in the occipital area. It is also thought to be due to T-cell autoimmune reaction that leads to inflammation of the hair follicle, which causes it to fall out. It generally does not respond well to treatment. In all those types of alopecia areata, the immune system plays a key role. This can also be seen histologically, where lymphocytes surround the hair follicle, which resembles a swarm of bees. The hair follicles also appear smaller. The spontaneous hair regrowth that I mentioned earlier occurs most often in the pathway of alopecia areata and less commonly in the subforms alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis. The treatment consists to a great degree of support of the patient and to offer cosmetic treatment in forms of wigs, makeup for eyebrows and other options. It is possible to use glucocorticoids in high doses topically. This is, however, usually not very effective. Systemic glucocorticoids usually lead to regrowth, but only in the time they are taken. The next type of alopecia is a huge topic. It is androgenic alopecia, and it is also a form of non-sclerosing alopecia. In this form, the hair loss is due to changes in the androgen metabolism, and it occurs in men most frequently, but also women can be affected. But for women it is considered pathological. People can have a genetic predisposition to androgenic alopecia, which to a large extent determines at which point in their life the hair loss will begin to become apparent. In women, a change in hormone levels in menopause often is the trigger for alopecia but also hormone-changing diseases as polycystic ovarian syndrome and hyperprolactinemia play a role. The hair loss follows usually a certain pattern. 
It often starts at the forehead hair border, the hairline, and around the vertex and progressively leads to complete baldness. Therapy is for men with minoxidil and finasteride. Those are medications that take influence in the conversion of testosterone to the form that is relevant for hair loss, called dehydrotestosterone. Finasteride is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. It also is used for benign prostate hyperplasia. DHT, so the dehydrotestosterone, is changing the growth cycle of the hair and inhibits the progression from the telogenic phase to the anagenic phase, in which the hair is supposed to grow. Different areas of the hair have variable sensitivity to testosterone, and so this pattern hair loss can be explained. So far so good for the alopecias, I would say. Let's continue now with the diseases of the pilosebaceous unit. First you might ask yourself what exactly the pilosebaceous unit contains. It comprises the hair shaft, the hair follicle, the sebaceous gland and the erector pili muscle. This unit is found in every area of the body that contains hair. In the section of the video, we will talk about acne vulgaris, rosacea, and perioral dermatitis. Acne vulgaris is that form of acne that many teenagers have to deal with, but it can also affect adults. Often changes in hormone levels are the culprit of the development of pimples, blackheads, and co. Mostly the skin of the face is affected. In most cases, the forehead and chin are especially affected and in some, a little bit more rare cases, also cleavage and back. Severe forms have to be treated by a dermatologist. There are different peelings and steam treatments which help to treat existing acne and prevent the formation of further ones, with hopefully minimal scar formation. In mild cases, washing agents for the face can already be enough to treat the condition. There are three stages of acne vulgaris depending on their severity. Acne comedonia is the mildest form. It only affects the forehead, nose and cheeks and mainly presents with blackheads called comedo, which only get inflamed if they are squeezed. Acne paculopustulosa is the next more severe form. Here the patients have comedo as well as inflamed pimples. This form is often found in the whole face and on the back. Acne conglobata is the most severe form. The acne here is very inflamed and these pimples often leave very deep scars. The next disease in our video is rosacea. It is a chronic inflammatory disease of the face, which presents with erythemas and teleangiectasia and sometimes also with papules and pustules. It mostly affects women over the age of 50 Predisposing factors are consumption of alcohol, sun exposure, spicy food and genetic predisposition. Local therapy consisting of careful cleaning, local use of antibiotics and vitamin E together with beta-carotene can help in some cases. Perioral dermatitis is the last topic I will talk about today. It is an inflammatory rash around the mouth and on the chin. The rash is often itchy and presents with small pimples. The exact cause is unknown, but it is thought to be due to overuse of cosmetics. Also cortisone creams, stress, oral contraceptives and intestinal disorders are thought to have a link to the disorder. To see if it is caused by cosmetics, it is advised to not use them for a few weeks and also to use a hypoallergenic washing agent for the clothes to see if those are causing the rash. The disease can be visible constantly or it can come in exacerbations. Mostly women in the age of 20 to 45 are affected. That's it for this video. I hope it was helpful and if you like our channel we would be very happy if you would subscribe. Thank you very much.